powered by Go Goat Sports and in partnership with TSN. This is season four. It is episode eight of the Rand Dregs Hockey Podcast. And it is presented by our title sponsor, Canadian Club Whiskey. Uh, we'll have more on this coming up, Ray. But as we know, the final series of the Chronicle series, the final release is the 45-year-old Canadian Club Whiskey. It's arriving everywhere, including our liquor shelves shortly. We're looking forward to that. And uh, there are just so many different layers. It's a, it's a mysterious brew, if we can call it that, this 45-year-old. And I keep reading about it and learning more about it. I can't wait to taste it. It's coming just in the nick of time, too, Drake's. <laughs> because we're getting we're getting a little shy on the, on the forty four. Yes, so. yes, we are. Yes, yes. So I'm looking forward to it. It's a uh, it's delicious, and you know I'm new to to the whole game and learning about it and from Tish and the fine yeah. folks at yeah. Canadian Club. But it is <laughs> um, it is wonderful. If you have the opportunity, you should check it out. You know I and we'll we'll get on with this, but I. I didn't do a very good job of rationing. You know, you joked about the 44, but we had the 43 and we've sampled others, you know, through uh, the good graces of Canadian Club Whiskey. But we probably should have saved a little, right? You know, See, just, I, I'm very just, dis- I'm very discriminating <laughs> as to who that bottle gets open for. I get it. I get it. You know, if the, knuckleheads, if, empty, the knuckle, you know? Hey, if the knuckleheads come <laughs> over, it doesn't. Yeah. No, very fair, very fair. Uh, Great episode ahead. We've got Nathan McKinnon from the Colorado Avalanche who, you know what, I mean, as a hockey fan, you recognize very quickly that this is a superstar talent, right? He just is. But to have the opportunity to to talk to Nate, um, you know, just the three of us talking hockey, he's a bit old school, isn't he? And we enjoy having the alumni on the podcast because they're not afraid to tell stories and tell it like it is and the experiences that, that they've had. And, you know, I think we're going to get a little bit of that from McKinnon because that's just who he is, right? He is just like he plays. He's straight ahead, yeah. um, flies off the cuff a little bit. I, I am thoroughly entertained listening to him. I love watching him play. Um, and, uh, you know, this year he goes everywhere as a Stanley Cup champion, and uh, oh, wow. really cool to have him on. Really cool. Yeah, it is. Looking forward to it. Uh, headlines, once again, this season presented by our friends at Boston Pizza. And full disclosure here to to anybody who's checking into the podcast or watching us on YouTube, we're recording this on Thursday night. It is 10.10 10 p.m. Eastern. Yes. Um, so we, we've had opportunity to peruse the games of the night, at least the Eastern Conference games. Um, so we're going to check on a little bit of everything. I, and I want to talk about the hot seat speculation that's hovering around Vancouver and New Jersey and some other spots in just a moment. But, um, you know, one of the games of interest, not just because it's the Toronto Maple Leafs, but there's a lot of heat on Toronto too, right? Similar to Vancouver, there's a lot of heat on on Toronto. Choices made. Sheldon Keefe, the coach, is pulling his words back after pointing the finger at his elite players. I know it's it it, it look at that's I, ridiculous. It is, and and I'm going to let you explain why you think it's ridiculous. I I feel like it's the organization almost succumbing to media pressure because more than media pressure, the media pressure kind of drives the social media uh, cycle and the wheel, mm-hmm. and maybe that you know, encourages the Leafs to, to backtrack or any team for that matter to backtrack. But I, I didn't think it was unfair what Keith said initially after the Arizona game, pointing the finger at some of his star guys. Yeah. But all that he said is we have elite players. They don't. Yeah. Our elite guys haven't found their stride yet or their groove. I think he said, um, mm-hmm. and they didn't have it tonight. Like what's so bad about that? I know. Like if know. you're patting somebody on the head all the time, um, and you give a, uh, an unrealistic picture yeah. about what's going on. That's just not the way it, it, it can work. Like, no, you, I understand it's not the same as when I played and you, you certainly should treat the players with respect and, um, and the players should treat the coaches in that same vein. But every once in a while you need to say, Hey, you got to get going. But he didn't even say that. Like all this, you know, the term that bugs me is 
oh, he called out his players. No, he didn't. Yeah. He said, we have elite players. They haven't found their groove yet. And we probably should win this game, but they didn't have it tonight. Yeah. That's the difference between us and Arizona. So I have, I have more problem that they walked it back. Like, yeah. seriously, who cares? Why are they so worried about what, for example, me and you think? Why would yeah. they even worry about that? Or the guys that write in the paper, a blog and um, various media outlets, why would you care? You're not mm-hmm. disrespecting anyone. You're saying we can be better than this. Yeah. That's it. Now everybody okay, give will me jump old, on the wagon today. Give me an old school getting called out. 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I mean, y- y- your coach goes to the media or more importantly comes to you directly. I guess to the media, you're, you're calling the player or the, yeah. the team out. Give me an example of that because it'd be far worse than, you know, what we heard from Sheldon Keefe. Uh, we took stupid penalties tonight. The penalty Ferraro took in the third period, they scored the power play goal on, um, cost us that point in the game. Now, the, could you be any more blunt than that? And, yep, <laughs> it, it, you just you took it. And you know what? If it was wrong or unfair, you could go the next day to talk to the coach about it. And you'd yeah. say, hey, that I thought that was BS. But – if I took a penalty with three minutes left in a 3-3 game and the other guy scored, well, what's he supposed to say? Geez, Ray tried really hard there, but took a slashing yeah. penalty behind the play? No, it's a, I, the directness of, the, of it all seems to have gone. There's more massage. There's more, uh, let's make sure it's the right message that came out in the, like, like even Sheldon saying that he, he misspoke and his words weren't what exactly he meant. Like you're splitting hairs here. He said we have yeah. we have elite players. They did not play as such, and they haven't got on track yet. What's wrong with that? If they Nothing. think four games in that they're on track, those guys, yeah. then the Leafs are sunk because none of them think that. And if they're that sensitive, honestly, to to that media, then they shouldn't be listening to it because it was nothing. And I don't think yeah. they are. I really don't. No. I, I, I don't think so. They, you know, they, they came, they come on Thursday, they win in overtime. Now everything's going to be great. And everything's going to be about Nick Robertson. And he's probably going to oh, score boy. 50 goals this year. And man, let the kid breathe. Let him play. He yeah. two terrific goals. He can really shoot the puck. He made, I like the play he made on the first goal where he shielded yeah. a much bigger Jamie Ben off the puck and quick release. And it's in the net, but there's a reason why young players go up and down and it's a really hard league and he'll have a good stretch and then he'll go dry and then he'll have a good stretch. And that's the evolution of a 21 year old. Yeah, it is. And and man, he played well. He really did in a, in a tough emotional game for him. He's playing against his older brother, Jason and, and the Dallas stars. But as I'm watching, you know, his game, I'm thinking, you know, we all know he made the Toronto Maple Leafs out of camp. He was sure. terrific. You know, for cap reasons, they didn't have a choice. He was waiver exempt. He goes down to the Toronto Marlies. He does not suck his thumb. He plays hard in the American League and, and hoped and knew that his opportunity was going to come. But it reminded me as I'm I'm watching, you know, that game unfold versus the Dallas Stars of a comment you made, an idea you had about having I don't want to call it a taxi squad because that conjures up bad memories of through the pandemic and all of that stuff. But the idea of having teams, an allowance of an emergency gaggle, if you will, of players so that you're not going with limited rosters, but a kid like this has an opportunity. He's not held back of his opportunity because of cap issues that his team is dealing with. Yeah. And it's a, it's a very temporary idea. Uh, until the cap grows and gets back to, you know, what we think it might be in the next year or two. So my idea is that you have three players that are um, essentially designated as reserve players. They they cannot make more than a million dollars. They can only come up in an emergency spot. Right. So, like, I'm in Florida. I've got the Panthers in Tampa Bay tomorrow night. Two games ago, Florida starts out with, five defensemen because Brandon Montour is hurt. 
and then Ekblad gets hurt. Now they got four defensemen. It's ridiculous. But they only have 20 players on their roster because they have no cap room. Why can't they bring up a defenseman that makes 900 grand to fill out their roster? Makes no sense to me. And I understand camp and revenues, and but they can only come up and they've got to go back down as soon as they're back to 20 skaters. Mm. So in this case, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't necessarily affect Nick Robertson because they wouldn't want to send him back down. Uh, no. They've got the opportunity with Murray on LTI, and um, so they were able to call up a couple of players. And and now, honestly, Nick Robertson goes to the American League. He comes up, the door swings open. Now you got to just storm right through it. Do not yeah. let them close the door on you again. Make them figure right. something else out. Yeah, I like the idea. And we're going to continue to revisit this idea because the cap teams aren't going anywhere for the foreseeable future, and neither is injury in the National Hockey League. And this issue is going to rear its ugly head as we plod through the season. Um, Before we get to the hot seat speculation, which I teased right off Uh the top of the podcast, I don't know, again, you're in Florida, if you had an opportunity to see any of the the Montreal Canadiens and the Arizona Coyotes game, but – this young defenseman, Arbor Jacki, who went through the draft undrafted, late bloomer, 100%, get it, it happens, um, went to the Memorial Cup of the Hamilton Bulldogs of the uh, American or of the Ontario Hockey League, signed by the Montreal Canadiens as a free agent. Um, I mean, he absolutely dusted Zach Cassian in a fight. But but here's the thing for me, Ray, is I've, I've watched this young guy enough to know and see. I don't know. If he's, he's probably never going to be a heavyweight. He's just a good fighter. But that's a, that's a part of his game. That's not his game entirely. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you see a late bloomer like this kid appears to be, and we have to leave a lot of slack in the rope. I mean, he's games, a few games into his NHL Mm -hmm. career, but it looks like he can shoot, looks like he can defend, looks like he's got decent hockey IQ. How do so many teams miss on an opportunity, or is it just opportunity, timing, and the right fit at the right time? Well, I mean, I don't know what he was like in his draft year or his draft year plus one. Yeah. Um, then you get to a point where you're not drafted and it gets to, you know, so like maybe the late growth and also drags, he might be a little bit, well, he's part of that group of kids in a special circumstance, like through the pandemic where, you know, scouting was a little different. They were doing a lot by video. There were less games. There were, the season stopped yeah. and started and, Maybe he just fell through the cracks. I will tell you, I hated playing guys like him. And the reason I did was because he's slightly unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And the unpredictability and the toughness, that bugged me more than anybody, than (laughs) anyone else. Because you're like, what what if he's having a bad shift and you just happen to be in the way? And so for Montreal, like to this kid's confident. Oh. And he's not he's not shy and no. he'll get popped somewhere. Right. But that that just appears to be part of his makeup. That yeah. he's in this and he's gonna play physically. And when Slavkovsky got hit, he was gonna make sure that everybody knew that yeah. wasn't quite okay. And so yeah. in a game where Slavkovsky scores his first goal uh against Arizona that Jack I makes uh, puts another little <laughs> notch for himself and more people yeah. will know about him and more people will know in the league about him as uh, as he continues to play games like this. Yeah. And then look, as the game has evolved at the NHL level, just hockey mm-hmm. period, I suppose, you know, I'd be marking the calendar of when Montreal plays the New York Rangers and Ryan Reeves. Well, I'm not. I'm not because I, I want to see this kid evolve as a hockey player. I don't I I don't have any misgivings that he's going to be the next big heavyweight of the NHL because it doesn't exist. And I don't look forward to him and Ryan Reeves fighting. It's just that he's, he's a compelling story across the board. All right. Hot seat speculation. I talked about it on insider trading. Um, Just trying to douse a little water on it. Right. And, and I, I, I I gave, you know, I include myself when I say 
This time of year, media doesn't have a whole lot to talk about when we don't have meaty hockey stories to dig into. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You look at the low-hanging fruit, and you see the teams that struggle, and that includes Vancouver, and that included New Jersey, and go down the list. I mean, you know, so you put Lindy Ruff in the crosshairs, and we put Bruce Boudreau in the crosshairs, um, and it seems a tad ridiculous. Now, look, could those men be fired? Of course. Of course. I mean, it's 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 a it's a game of results. It's a league of success. But I, I'm curious where you stand on this, because the management people that I deal with on a day by day basis constantly remind me we we want to let the players push and get through the tough patches. And we need the coaches to help them through that. So when we're convinced that the players aren't going to push anymore, then as management, we engage and we make a tough decision and that can end up in a coaching change. That doesn't happen four or five games into a regular season. Well, so here's, I, I think it matters, Dregs, um, who the team is, what their level of expectation is. And one six and one can look terrible or it can look not bad. Right. And and it depends how a lot of it I think depends how it looks. If there's no fight in the team, you got to be careful. You don't. We mm-hmm. know the numbers yeah. like American Thanksgiving. There's not much movement once you get past that. So you can't let your team start out four thirteen and one, and then go. Oh gee, we're going to catch up. Where are you going to win nine games in a row mm-hmm. to get the five hundred? You're not. No. And so I think that's that's what makes in a parody league makes teams a little itchier, a little earlier. However, four games is just not, I mean, that's not it. I mean, here's the other thing. If that was four games in January, nobody would even blink. No, that's fair. You'd be like, man, they're going through a tough stretch. Well, now these teams haven't won a game since last April. (laughs) And so everybody's a little, a little edgy, a little, you know, and so, you know, as we're taping this right now, it's 3-3 in Minnesota. And mm-hmm. there's Minnesota and Vancouver. They don't have a win, either of them. You know, and do, do you yeah. think yeah. Do you think things are going great in Minnesota? They've given up now 23 goals God, in four no. games. Yeah. You know, so it's Minnesota. It, you know, like San Jose, I don't uh, – David Quinn just got there. I don't you know. That, that's not a conversation. But had Toronto lost today – and maybe lose their next one. Well, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait a minute. Because of the expectation of that team, the expectation in Chicago, the expectation in San Jose, Arizona is in a different realm. And so I don't think it it matters anywhere near the same. No, well said. Um, Want to talk about quick start surprises, but I want to let that breathe a little bit. And I think you do too, right? Like, let's go through the weekend. You know, Philadelphia, of course, John Tortorella is always going to attract our interest. Um, so, you know, quick start surprise, Philadelphia 3-1, and one, of course. But let's let's get through the weekend yeah. and maybe we'll revisit that as part of headlines on, uh, on Tuesday in the next episode of the Ray and Riggs podcast. Headlines once again this season presented by our friends at Boston Pizza. 